You know the drill now. There are 48 multiple choice questions on the test, many of which will come from the review quiz up on Moodle for unlimited attempts. We've also included some of the matching quizzes, and I won't say which ones, but I had an uncharacteristic fit of mercy and decided not to include the materials and methods matching questions. This may have something to do with the fact that I myself missed several of them when I previewed the test. There are just too many varieties of stone and stone workmanship to keep straight. I'd still recommend that you review these questions now and just before the AP exam. And finally, you'll have one essay question. Let's start there. This is an, actually an essay question from 1992. That exam featured a different but very similar Egyptian statue. I've tried to modify the question to reflect the current AP curriculum, and I've also included the dates on this slide. You will not need to give that information. So here's the big news for your Unit 2 test. You are going to get the question in advance. Again, I'm giving it to you here. But this time, you're going to have to write without notes. So we're deflating the life raft a little. And eventually, you'll have to swim in the deep end without a raft and answer questions that you haven't seen in advance. That's what will happen on the AP test, after all. The first two parts of the question are very straightforward, but you will have to have this information memorized. You can answer both parts in a single sentence, but make sure it's clear which information refers to which work. It's okay to use terms work on the top and work on the bottom for now. Part C asks about the function of the statues, how they were actually used, and how this function or use relates to each culture's beliefs. Remember that this is an invitation to write as much as you can about the culture, as well as the work of art. Include specific details and use your art history vocabulary. This, by the way, is where students across the country tend to lose points on the AP exam. They do pretty well with visual descriptions and evidence, but they do not include enough specific discussion and especially enough specific evidence about cultural context. So run faster than those other deer, okay? Again, this is not a College Board question, and this is not an exact rubric that you will encounter on actual AP questions. We'll start in on real AP questions in the next unit. But what is similar to the College Board rubrics is that you're being asked to support your claims with specific evidence. Often AP questions will ask for both visual evidence, what you actually see, and contextual evidence or information about the culture. So what is evidence? The AP graders and your grader will be looking to see that you provided a specific detail about the appearance of the work, visual evidence, or a specific detail about the culture, in this case beliefs in which this work was created, cultural evidence, context, excuse me, contextual evidence. On the AP exam, you will only need one piece of evidence to get the evidence point, but it has to be a piece of evidence that the graders think is appropriate. In practice, this usually means a piece of evidence that shows up on the scoring guidelines that the College Board provides to AP graders. You are not marked down for incorrect information, but you will lose the point if you fail to hit on something that appears on the grader's list of acceptable evidence. My advice, and you're going to hear this a lot, is always include two pieces of evidence, at least. This greatly increases your odds of making one of the points that appears on the scoring guide. Again, you'll encounter actual AP scoring guides next unit. My further advice, and you've already heard this, prepare to hear it again often. Write more. Student essays, especially student test essays from the first few units, are almost always too short. If you have time left over, add some more detail. The test includes a number of both old and new questions about this work. It's a longtime College Board favorite, so I have old questions I can use. But it's also on the current curriculum's required works list. So what do you need to know? Who are these people? How was this work made? Make sure you know the difference between bas relief, sunken relief, and high relief. What function did this work of art serve? What stylistic conventions do you observe, especially conventions designed to highlight the relative importance of the participants? How would you sum up the Code of Hammurabi? You might look up the term on this slide, lex talionis. I'm going to give you one more very broad hint, since I think this one, this actual past AP question is unclear. There is no historical record of the specific event shown on this stela, that is, Hammurabi's investiture by a god. But Hammurabi is a real historical figure. We have lots of evidence of his rule. One of your wrong answers about this work will be metal repoussé. 
That is a sculptural technique, really neither additive nor subtractive, where thin sheets of metal are punched out into a shape. The gold face of Agamemnon that you see here is a famous example, although it's not one of our required works. I'm just telling you this so you don't worry when you see an unfamiliar term on the test. By May, you will know a lot more art vocabulary. Ah, one of the very first works you encountered this summer. Why is it so important to art history, and for that matter, to world history? What is its content? What event is this work commemorating? How does the artist show rank? What animals are used to symbolize the pharaoh? And hint, big hint, in both cases, these animals are shown making life difficult for an enemy. Note that I said animals, plural. What do those small stacked bodies represent? What is the funny guy with the hat on the left side doing? Finally, what is the term for the way the narrative is arranged? Remember Calvin and Hobbes? By the way, the questions refer to left and right sides. That's as you see them. So the serpiparts, those funny entwined animals, are on the right. How was this work made? With what materials? Where was it found? At what function did it serve? What story is the work telling? What is the content? How does the work reflect its culture and that culture's values and practices? There are also questions about who or what is portrayed within the circles. The review questions include what I thought were hard questions about this work. Do not forget to go through the review quiz. What are the columns in the hypostyle hall imitating? I talked about this in my lecture. As a pharaoh walked through the temple complex, starting at the pylon gates, moving through the hypostyle hall, and finally standing at the sanctuary, what was his experience? What changed in terms of the physical appearance of the rooms as he moved further and further into the temple? I don't think you'll have a hard time with this one, but note that the plan comes without labels. And here's a hint. He begins here. You remember the term, right? He enters an open courtyard. Then he enters this section of the temple. Note the light source. You remember that term too, right? And finally, he comes to the inner sanctuary. Do you remember what would have resided there? I don't think you'll have a hard time with this question, but this image, which does not appear on the test, offers a good clue. Think about the relative roles of the pharaoh, the priests, and the ordinary people. And here's another clue. The label says, Pharaoh Ramses II carrying an offering to the god Amun. What are the characteristics of the relief sculpture of the ancient Near East? What devices are used to show narrative to indicate an individual's importance or impotence? What are the names for the three kinds of stone relief you've encountered so far? So only the work on the right is one of your required images, but you should be able to identify the likely period of the two works to its left. We talked about this when we talked about how New Kingdom architecture differed from Old Kingdom architecture. What would you not find in the building on the right that was originally placed in the buildings on the left? So here's another image question that showed up frequently on past exams. I guess the College Board thinks these are cool too. Know what these beasts are called and what their function was at the palace. So this is a materials question and not an easy one, although I don't think you'll actually have much trouble guessing the right answer. Remember that the Mesopotamians were heavily dependent on trade. They produced a lot of valuable agricultural goods for sale, but they needed to import many items, including stone and what's the white stuff? Where does it come from? Hint, it is the wrong an or the answer the, to the accept question, the wrong answer is not a material commonly associated, excuse me, this, the white material in this is not a material commonly used for statues, especially in ancient Greece and Renaissance Italy, but the accept answer is. Sorry, that got a little unclear. So I found one of the questions on this work, or rather the right answer choice, a little tricky. Scribes were members of the upper classes, but they were not pharaohs, and that's probably the most important reason why the scribe's body is seen as less than perfect, and that will help you answer one of the questions. But to get other, another question right, think about what scribes did all day. They sat around, right? What happens to couch potatoes if we're not careful? There's another question about this work's function. You know it has something to do with the afterlife because art in Egypt 
always has something to do with the afterlife. But I don't think I mentioned this in my lecture, and it wasn't in the Khan Academy video either. This was found in the general vicinity of the Pharaoh's tomb. Actually, scholars aren't entirely sure of where it was originally placed, since the site was heavily looted. But I think it's pretty clear that the scribe was ready to go to work for a reborn Pharaoh. It's also possible that this was a Ka statue for the scribe himself. But this was an old kingdom work, a period when elaborate tombs tended to be reserved for Pharaohs. I thought this was another tricky question. One obvious advantage of sunken relief on columns, as this photo comes from the temple at Karnap shows, is that it casts strong shadows in the Egyptian sun. And of course, the sculptures would have been painted back in the day, but the shadow still would have highlighted the message. Sunken reliefs also preserve the structure of the columns. They still look wrong round and therefore create the impression of a papyrus forest. The expert who wrote the question says that they are not easier to carve, so I just gave you the answer. Another correct reason for sunken relief rather surprised me, however, since it seemed to contradict the point about retaining the column structure. Sunken reliefs hide the function of columns as supporting elements and instead emphasize the images and messages portrayed in the sculpture. So sunken relief maintains the uniformity of the column shape while also focusing attention on the message itself. Well, I thought that was confusing, but possibly right. The person entering the temple was bombarded with important messages, but also confronted with an image of the primeval forest. Sunken relief accomplished both, while raised relief sculptures would only preserve the message. Anyway, I just gave you the answer. As always, I included this question, even though I thought it was confusing, because I want you to get used to, well, confusing questions that somebody else wrote. There are a number of similarities between these works. I don't think you'll have trouble figuring out the right answer, but note that you will not have the image for the question. Think about how the figures on each are portrayed. How does the artist indicate status? You all know this guy, right? What are these called, or what is this kind of hall called? What are the characteristic stylistic features of this culture's art as exhibited by these works? You haven't seen the image on the right, but it's from the same culture, which you will need to be able to identify. By the way, these images themselves won't be on the test, just a description of the stylistic conventions. I've had you focus on Old Kingdom and New Kingdom, but this is an actual old AP question. What's tricky is that one choice is 2000 BCE and another is 2500 BCE, which is closer. You'll probably want to look this one up. What are two required works that you've studied that are carved with gray whack, a hard, dark sandstone? I'm showing you a picture of the rock and I have another sculpture made from gray whack. Hint, one of the works is from ancient Egypt and one is from our global prehistoric unit. By the way, you've studied three works carved from gray whack. The answer will just have two of them. This is one of the most famous moments in archaeological history. In 1923, Howard Carter opened this previously unopened, undiscovered tomb and found an incredible gold coffin. Whose was it? You know that. Here's an example of I'm not looking for a specific identification here, but a vocabulary word used for this kind of stone commemorative slab. This is one of those terms you need to know, but I think it's an easy one to remember. And another term you need to know. The photo will not appear on the exam, but it should give you the answer. Good luck on your second unit test.